Hi, this is Drew Jones of Drew's Guitar Shop in Seattle, Washington, and today I wanted to do a video uh, demonstrating how I would carve a compensated, uh, a custom compensated bone saddle for a classical guitar. Um, I can show you how I do it, and I can talk you through some of the big points, but I don't think that watching this video is necessarily going to give you the experience chops sort of skills that um, can't really be conveyed in a video. Um, the reason that I say that is I once uploaded a video of doing this on a ukulele and I got a lot of comments from people asking me to explain in detail how I got the numbers that I got um, for the contact points on the saddle that I was carving. And so, um, in hopes of avoiding all that, um, i just like to state that out front that uh, watching this will give you an idea of how to do this, but this is not a by the numbers, if you do it exactly this way, it will work on your guitar sort of tutorial. So, with all that said, let's go ahead and get started. So, this is the saddle that we're replacing. This is the saddle that came in this guitar. There are a number of reasons why I don't like it. Um, for one thing, it's got a slight curvature on the top, and this is a classical guitar, so it's a dead flat fretboard. Um, that's not good. <laughs> um, so, uh, right off the bat, we're seeing problems with this, with this saddle. Uh, the other thing that I don't like about it is that it's, uh, it's just got one of those uh, curved crowns. Everything is kind of dead center, and so you know, there's not really a whole lot of compensation that differentiates the contact point on the saddle from string to string in order to, uh, in order to custom intonate each string, which is really a good idea if you want to maintain good intonation. So let's talk about intonation for a minute. Intonation is basically the explanation that I would give to a player is that this is, um, this is the thing that determines whether or not your instrument plays in tune up and down the neck. So if your guitar is intonated, what that means is that when you play your open E and then you go down and fret at the 12th fret, you should have a perfectly in tune E at the 12th fret. That would be an ideal situation for intonation. Now, ideal is ideal. You don't usually see it in real life, especially on acoustic guitars. On electrics, you can get a lot closer. In fact, you can get very precise with an electric guitar, but with an acoustic, you generally have to kind of you generally have to kind of be happy with what you get. Um, and part of that is because it's, um, no one's invented a really good way of uh, adjustable saddles on, a, on an acoustic guitar. I've seen some definitely, you know, some good attempts, um, some Gary Fleischmann guitars that have some movable saddles that are pretty neat. But um, yeah, there aren't really a lot of guitars out there where you can just kind of gently you know, move things back and forth very carefully and get exactly by the numbers things. Generally, you're kind of using a file and you're cutting the saddle and going, well, I hope it works. Um, and generally, you can get pretty close. The other reason why you won't see perfectly intonated acoustic guitars is that um, this top will expand and contract with moisture and with heat. And so with that expansion and contraction, the strings get raised or the strings get lowered, which will affect the tension on the strings which will affect the intonation of the guitar. So in one way, in one sense, um, we don't see a lot of guitars with the hardware capable of doing this and in the other sense it's almost pointless to try doing it because the instrument itself is going to sabotage any attempt at making it perfect. So we go ahead and try to get acoustic guitars as close as we can but we can't be exact. So. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be replacing this saddle, which has this curvature issue and this crowning issue, um, with one that has neither of those and hopefully is better all around. So this is the um, <clears throat> this is the uh, uh, blank that I have so far, and what I want to see as far as a blank is I want to see you know a fairly snug fit. It doesn't have to be you know <clears throat> you know you have to pound it in with a mallet tight, but you do want it to touch on all sides. And so this is about where I want to see it, maybe slightly looser than I'd like to see, but it is pretty good. We're not getting any leaning back and forth, and we're not hearing any little clicks when I do this. So 
this saddle is currently flat on top and what I've done is I've rolled off the sharp edges with a little bit of 500 grit sandpaper so that it won't cut the strings when we go on to doing the next step. But for the time being, what we're going to do is we're going to place the old saddle in there. And the reason that we're doing that is because part of this procedure is going to require that we tune this guitar up to pitch. And when we do that, the strings are going to experience a lot of tension here on this corner if we leave that one in. And it's probably, even despite the fact that we rolled off that corner, going to damage the strings a little bit. So we want to do all the string stretching and all of the hard stuff with the old saddle that's going to be nice and comfortable for those strings. And so we're going to go ahead and put this in there first. All right, so we have the strings on the guitar. They are tuned up to about where we want them. The ends have not been trimmed here at the tie block or at the headstock end, and we are still using the old original saddle. So what we're going to do next is we're going to detune and we're going to place in the new saddle. Now this new saddle has been carved almost to the height that it needs to be using the old strings that were on here before because I didn't care about tearing those strings up. This um, new set of strings though I definitely want to keep safe and so I would really like to reiterate um, and emphasize that I have gone and uh, sanded off this back corner using some 500 grit. You don't have to like put a huge bevel on it, but what you do want to do is you want to get rid of that sharp edge because if you don't get rid of that sharp edge, what's going to happen is that when you string this up to pitch, this corner here could cut into the back of this string, or could cut into the string and could either cause the string to break or it can uh, cause some significant damage to the string that would otherwise render it kind of unusable. Um, and since these are Savarez red cards, they're like, you know, $20 a set or something like that. Um, you know, we're going to want to try to keep these intact. Um, in general, like, you know, just don't waste money on strings. Like, you want to do your setup and your intonation with the set of strings that you're going to be playing on. So I wouldn't recommend, like, going the course of getting, like, some cheap set of strings to just, you know, do this and throw away at the end of the day. Unless your idea of doing that is using, you know, the same strings that you're going to be playing with. You want to use the strings that you're going to be playing with because you need to intonate for the tension, for the width, and for the type of string that you have. If you intonate for Savarez, you know, if you intonate, for example, for some, you know, Alice strings that you got off of eBay, um, your guitar is going to be intonated for Alice guitars off of eBay, and then when you throw your Savarez red cards on there or whatever it is that you play, it's not going to intonate for those strings. So again, you want to intonate for the same strings and you also want to protect the strings as you're doing this. So definitely knock that corner off and use the same set that you're going to be playing on for doing this intonation. So right now what we need to do is we need to detune the guitar, put in the new saddle and tune up to pitch again so that we can uh, check our intonation against a tuner and take our measurements. All right, so we have the new saddle in place and we have the guitar tuned up. More or less in tune. <clears throat> if you come around here and you look at the string height at the 12th fret, you'll see that that is quite high. Um, and I did that on purpose. Um, so when measuring that new saddle against this saddle, I made sure to leave a lot of room um, to take that down a little bit. And so this was used as a reference, um, but I went ahead and uh, put a few extra 30 seconds of an inch on the saddle. You obviously want to keep in the realm of safety, so like just slightly more than half of this saddle is out of, the, is out of that slot. Um, rule of thumb is that you don't want um, any more saddle over the slot as you have under the slot. Um, a little more in this case is fine. It's a nylon string, it's low tension. Um, you can still, keep in mind, snap that front end out of your bridge. And if that happens, that's a bad, bad place to be. So don't leave a whole lot of saddle here to provide leverage on this little tiny thing here because that's really the only thing keeping your saddle from you know popping forward. So keep that in mind. 
our next step is going to be to get the string height that or string height that we want, and um, that is going to mean tuning this back up to perfect pitch, and then going down here and measure, taking our measurement. Now I measure at the 12th fret regardless of whatever instrument I'm doing. Um, you take your measurement wherever it is that you take it, and then we're going to have to lower the saddle um, the correct amount to get the string height that we want. Um, now, some notes on this particular action here. Um, there's a formula for this, and there's a formula for this. In classical guitar setups, it is common uh, for the strings to be quite a lot higher than they would be on a steel string guitar. So bear that in mind when you're comparing your string action on a nylon string to your steel string. Um, that those two things are not supposed to be the same and so if you're looking at one and going oh this is much higher um, when you're looking at the nylon string that's that's probably where that's supposed to be um, not that being said I mean there are of course nylon string guitars out there with bad action but relatively speaking your action on a nylon string should be higher than a steel string the reason for that is that these strings have quite a lot more movement when you pluck them and so you just need more clearance um, it's as simple as that um, if you compare the movement of that low E to the low E on your steel string guitar, you're going to see that this one moves a lot more, and this one needs more clearance as a result, so that's why the action is higher. So anyway, that aside, talk about some numbers here. So in a lot of cases, a standard number that I see thrown out there is about a quarter of an inch on the treble side at the 12th fret, uh, from the bottom of the string to the top of the fret and uh, about 530 seconds on the bass side. Um, that is kind of like the one of the more standard numbers that I see out there. Uh, another number would be uh, maybe um, you know 330 seconds on this side and 430 seconds on this side and you might see higher or lower than that depending on how somebody plays how this how they want their guitar set up and um, you know what it is that they're trying to achieve um, action on a guitar can be taken down as low as you want to take it and if you don't care about buzzing at all then you can practically lay the strings on the board and have no problem but there's a physical barrier that you have to deal with as far as like doing a low setup without getting any buzzing because there's going to come a point where you're going to encounter buzzing no matter what you're doing on any guitar. So um, I would highly advise that um, you know if you're not experienced at doing setup work that you consult a book. There's the Dan Earlywine book, there's um, you know there's probably some others out there as far as doing uh, you know classical guitar specific stuff but I would definitely poke around because this isn't a setup video. This is mainly just talking about the saddle. Um, so getting to that saddle, to achieve the height that you want here, you need to measure this. And however high this is in 60 fourths, you need to take just slightly more than that off of this end in 30 seconds. That is to say, Whatever you want to move down here, you need to move twice here. So however low, however lower you want to get this, you have to lower this twice that amount and a little bit extra. Just a little bit extra, not a whole lot. Uh, we're dealing with very, very fine measurements here, and so I just kind of want to, you know, preface here. We're talking, we're talking about the little lines here. <laughs> The little lines here are determined by the big lines here. The big lines are what we're talking about here. The small lines are what we're talking about down here. So keep that in mind. A little bit goes a long, long way. And you can definitely feel the difference in a setup that is 164th higher, that's one of these little guys, to uh, you know, one that's 60, one, you know, 164th lower. Um, and that's you know, kind of something to keep in mind. So this is a, a pretty precise thing that needs to be done here.
But what we're going to do is we're going to measure down here, we're going to lower the appropriate amount, and we're going to get this um, string height set before we do our intonation. And the reason that we're doing that is because the tension of the strings is going to largely dictate where we need to put the crown point. And if we have a tall saddle right now, as we do right now, there's going to be more tension on these strings than there would be when it is lowered to the appropriate amount. And if we, uh, if we intonate for this higher tension, when we go to our lower tension, it's not going to be intonated correctly. So, basically as simple as that. So, next step, I'm going to go ahead and do that off camera, and uh, we'll come back to you when we are doing our next step. Alright, so we are at the stage here where we can figure out where to put our crown point on this saddle. Um, we have the string height set, the neck is good, the nut is good, basically everything about this setup is, is just about done. Uh, we just need to figure out where we're crowning the saddle. And so what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be playing these strings open, you'll see on the tuner, they are tuned and then I'm going to be playing them at the 12th fret and you're going to be able to see how off they are or you know whether or not they're kind of close. Um, once we do that I'm going to be taking a sharpened mechanical pencil and I'm going to be drawing a line on the saddle that will determine where I'm cutting to when I go to cut the crown on this saddle. I have an illustration here that's a lot bigger so that I can illustrate to you where about on the saddle I am putting that line so if you're looking at this, this represents the top of that saddle. So that little tiny rectangle there is that rectangle there. And this one here is for your benefit because it's going to be very hard for you to see the lines that I'm putting on here uh, in the video. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to go through and we need to tune. And we largely just want to get, kind of get a sense of the character of the guitar at this point. Because what can happen is sometimes you get a guitar that has a saddle that's too far forward or too far back. And in those cases, um, different things need to be done. Um, if you have one that's in the territory where it can be intonated, though, um, this is, you know, ideally what we're looking at. And um, we'll check out this guitar to see how it goes. And you need to go kind of quick here because these strings are still stretching out. So that's pretty, it's a little sharp sharp for that low E. Just about on the money for that A. Just maybe a hair sharp for the D. Very, very sharp for that G string. Maybe just a little flat for the B. Just a hair flat on the B is not actually a bad thing in IMO, but... We do kind of want to get these as close as possible. Alright, so none of these are... None of these, aside from maybe that G, are scary looking in terms of how uh, far off they are. Uh, the next thing that you want to do is you want to go and take a look this way on the saddle and determine where the string is currently making contact on what you have because it's very possible that you end up with something like this where the string is just kind of going over that rounded back edge and it's just kind of hanging out and there's not a whole lot of contact or any contact at all here and so where the contact is right now is going to be where you want to measure your line against so keep that in mind so Here's the rule of thumb for how to uh, move a crown point when you're intonating. If at that 12th fret you are getting a flat intonation, you want to move forward. So shortening this distance here between the saddle crown point and the 12th fret. If you are getting a sharp reading, you want to move back, widening that distance between the crown point on the saddle and the 12th fret. So, again, if we are too flat, we need to go this way, and if we are too sharp, we need to go that way. 
So that's what we're going to be doing here is uh, playing and figuring out which one of those directions we have to move and about how far we need to move it. Going to tune up again. You want to make sure all the strings are in tune when you do this. Because that will affect things. Alright, let's do our uh, low E first. This is kind of dependent on where you have your finger on the fret too, so keep that in mind. You want to do your intonation with your finger right in the middle of the fret or where you would play it normally. So that's just a little sharp, or sorry, yeah, a little sharp. And so looking at that, it's making contact pretty close to the front of the saddle. It's making contact about here. And so we just want to move it back just a little bit. So for you guys on the camera, where I've moved that to is roughly about here. Somewhere at an in-between point between completely forward and right in the middle. For the low E. So let's go ahead and do the A string. almost in the same territory and so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put the line in about the same spot partially because they're so close but also because it's a lot easier and better to carve two slots that are about on the same plane and so that one again is going about in between the uh, completely forward position and the middle position here so, we're going to go ahead and do the D string next. That one's so close, it's just a little tiny bit sharp. And so, I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to kick that line just about to the front. And I have a feeling that the little tiny bevel that I'm going to need to put there just to finish off the nut is going, or the, sorry, the saddle is going to uh, provide us with that little bit of backward, um, backward motion that we're going to need on that crown point. So where I've put that roughly is about here for the uh, D string. So not quite exactly on that corner, but you know, just, just south of that corner. It's a little tiny bit of space there. G string is really, really sharp. Sorry, I think I may have said that was flat earlier, but this direction is sharp. This direction is flat. It's definitely a very sharp string. Looking at it, I don't think that we're going to get very close in the ballpark with that string. I think we're going to have to just go with as good as we get. And so I'm going to go ahead and put that one basically right up to the back of the saddle, or back of the, yeah, back of the saddle. So that's about where that G ended up. It's not quite exactly on the corner. We're going to have to round that over a little bit just to, you know, be kind to our strings. But um, it's pretty far back. It's about as far back as we can put it. And our B string. Yeah, this is the only one I think actually that ended up being kind of flat. And 
now it's sharp. Intonation is funky. Now we're getting it to go flat again just a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and take a look at where that's making contact. Um, if need be, you can kind of take a light look at it too. There will be a shadow under the string that makes it much easier to tell where you're at. And this string is actually making contact pretty close to the back of the saddle. And so I think that that's about as close as we're going to get with it. So I'm going to go ahead and put that right back there where the uh, G string is. These two can hang out together on the same plane. And then the last one here is going to be the high E. You notice how that kind of went back and forth? That's something you'll encounter sometimes. If you have a string that's really insistent on going kind of back and forth on a tuner, it's kind of best to take the whatever the middle of the road is on that as your uh, as your number. But I'm not sure that this string is consistently doing that. So it's going a little bit sharp more than it's going anything else. So I'm going to go ahead and take a look at where that contact point is. Yeah, and that one's actually pretty far back too. So I'm going to go ahead and put that line right about there. A little secret, I'm putting that one just a hair, a hair forward more than I would. Um, because I don't want to completely um, take away the little tiny bit of sharpness that that has. I find that um, when doing intonation on instruments that um, going by the numbers doesn't always necessarily produce the best results. Um, sometimes it's better to kind of cheat things one way or another and one of the ways I like to do that is I like to cheat the high E and we're talking about just a hair, just a hair, like a couple of cents very very minuscule amount um, just a hair sharp and then for the B just a, like again just like a hair flat um, and doing just um, doing just a hair sharp for the uh, G string and then going down here and doing about a hair flat for the uh, e, uh, low E string and um, there are reasons that I like doing that um, that particularly relate to how chord shapes are made on the guitar and what those end up resulting in tension wise um, but what I notice when I do that versus when I don't is that um, the chords end up sounding a little less crunchy um, when I do that and when I don't do that um, they uh, sound about like they would on any other guitar so I don't necessarily advocate that everybody kind of go in and figure out exactly how you want to cheat things back and forth as far as your intonation um, like this is just something that came to me after years of playing around with stuff um, but <clears throat> you know it's something that you can do and, and um, you know it's also just something to keep in the back of your mind when you're comparing something with a strobe tuner oh I forgot to put the mark on here for that uh, string so we're just putting that one just like a like a tiny 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 little bit forward from these guys um, so that's about how that process goes. Now, if we were encountering a guitar where the saddle was way too far forward and every single string on here was intonating kind of sharp, um, 
what we would do at that point would be to go through and see exactly how sharp and how off things were. And there are two options that you can take at that point. One is that you can uh, crown the saddle completely, all of it, just back. And so this back edge of the saddle, that would be your crown point for all of those strings since every single one of them is sharp um, by usually a lot if the bridge is out of place. Um, Another way that you can go about that is if you have some that are intonating on that bridge and some that are just way, way off, you can take the ones that, are, that you're able to get intonated and intonate those as closely as you can and then take the rest of them and, and send them all back like that. Otherwise, what you can also choose to do is you can also go through and you can um, kind of take how off they are in one direction or another and kind of I don't know, move your center point on the tuner if that makes sense. And so like, you know, if you're ideally tuning for this point here in the center and you're seeing all of your stuff kind of take place over here, maybe this is now your center point and you tune, you intonate for this point here. So taking your stuff that's really sharp and moving it back a little bit and taking your stuff that's a little bit relatively flat and moving it forward a little bit. Um, the whole instrument will be, you know, it'll have intonation issues regardless, um, but it'll maybe be better in tune with itself at that point. Um, I would recommend, though, if you have a situation where you have a uh, instrument that has a badly placed bridge, that uh, you consider um, a longer term solution and a better solution, which would be to maybe get a bridge re glue mm -hmm. done on it in the appropriate place. On classical guitars, that's a little bit hard because um, these, you can find oversized bridges for these that'll cover a footprint because there will be one. If you move it forward, you're going to have a footprint back here, and if you move it backwards, you're going to have a footprint here. Um, but moving the bridge entirely um, to a point where the saddle is uh, in the appropriate place is the best solution overall for that. And then you can go through and you can do your intonation and you can get that, get those numbers that you want to see. So, um, yeah, um, that's about the process of my thinking behind getting these numbers. And so um, there's not really any sort of calculation that I'm doing here. Um, I am taking kind of an overall uh, how much is this instrument off, and I'm kind of, you know, condensing that into the space that I have to work with. And I'm using kind of where I'm seeing those things fall from the thing that's most sharp to the thing that's most flat to move these contact points within that space that I have to work with. And so that's basically how that works. Uh, in some cases I can get things pretty close um, and in um, a lot of cases they sound much better than they did when they came in. Um, so it's a good good thing to do regardless of you know whether or not you're able to hit everything on the money every single time um, because an intonated saddle is always going to sound better one, than one that's not or one that's like kind of like kind of a generic intonation cut like one that I see often for uh, classical guitar saddles is uh, kind of the double lightning bolt so you'll see like you know this kind of thing so there's your trebles and there's your bass strings. But as you can see here, that's not what we ended up with. So if we had done this on this guitar, you know, that wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been the ideal intonation for this instrument. Um, so yeah, uh, the next step that I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and put a little tiny line in between, about in the center point between those strings. And in the cases where I've got two things that are not close to each other, um, this one's going to be carved, you know, back along that center line, and this one's going to be carved forward along that center line. Because um, I like to keep things kind of neat um, when I do this. Um, there's some folks out there that kind of prefer to use like a rounded file and to just kind of go in and kind of scoop this out. Um, and kind of scoop this out and kind of leave sort of a, a, a more soft shape. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, as long as the contact point ends up in the same spot, that's all the guitar cares about. I like things to look pretty crisp. And so um, when I go through, I like to have those crisp lines. 
and that's the only reason that I do that. It's not a it's not a thing that's majorly important to uh, the intonation um, or the functionality of the saddle. So the next uh, thing that I need to do is I need to go through and actually cut those contact points and um, go through and polish the bridge or go polish the saddle. And so, in order to do that. Um, what I will typically use is a set of these guys. Just some cheap files that you can pick up at uh, a cabinet shop or Harbor Freight or eBay or wherever. And um, I also found these guys on eBay, which are pretty cool. Um, this is a uh, set of uh, gridded diamond files. So these red ones are 250, um, sorry, 240, I think, and then these green ones are. Uh, 600 and then these are 400 and so I can go in and after I do the rough cut with these guys I can clean up the rough cut with these guys and get that all worked all the way down to that 600 grit and then my last step is always to take um, a strip of 1000 grit sandpaper and go around the file with it using the file as a sanding block and going in and filing or sanding all of those little nooks and crannies that are in the saddle with uh, 1000 grit and then taking steel wool to it and bearing down fairly hard on that steel wool to, to you know get a good polish on it and after that it goes to my buffing wheel and so by the time I get done with these these are very very shiny they're like little pieces of jewelry and um, you know they're very very slick too the polishing is not just for looks it's also because it enables the string to kind of glide over that saddle without getting caught easier smooth surfaces are better for strings so, yeah, keep that in mind. Um, if you don't have a buffing wheel, um, that's completely understandable. I think most of the people watching this video probably don't. Um, just go on with the steel wool. Going with that 4 out steel wool is probably a fine way to finish out your saddle. Um, and I don't think it, you're going to have too many problems with it. A little bit. I'm actually going to show you how to do a little bit of cutting here, um, or at least how I do cutting. Um, this is the thing that I use to hold my nuts and saddles when I carve, um, and it is a frame clamp. Um, you can probably pick these up at an art store. I happen to inherit this one from my grandmother, who probably used it uh, to make canvas stretchers because she was a painter. Um, and the reason that I like using this is because the jaws on this thing are really narrow, and it enables me to get a really steep angle in here without encountering, um, you know, jaws of a big vice or something like that. Um, you can probably find some other ways to do this, like, I don't know, maybe you could partially hold it in a C-clamp or something uh, while you're working on it. You just need to be very careful not to break anything. Um, and uh, I'm just going to go ahead and start uh, filing. So, I'm going to go ahead and take this uh, little tiny needle file, and I'm going to start diving in here. You can, um, if you so want take a pencil and kind of rub the top of the saddle to kind of give you an idea of where you have cut and where you have not. If you have eyesight issues, I highly recommend doing this because it makes the job just so much easier to look at and you don't have to do as much guesswork. All right, so right up there is our first line, and we're going to go down to our second line here. So since we're starting at a, um, a new section, I'm going to go ahead and dig a corner in, and then I'm going to go ahead and cut down to where I dug that corner in, because that corner is going to be about at the same plane as where I want to make my cut to. Yeah, and the noise is uh, not the most pleasant. I apologize for those who are sensitive to that, but uh, it comes with the territory of my work. And the next one is going to be these guys. So we're going to dive in a corner here. This one. So I always want to take whatever is the most forward out of what I have next as my point to cut to.
yeah, that's a nice clean line. Same width all the way across. That takes a little bit of skill to get there, especially with these smaller files. If you want, you can use a bigger file to kind of get more of a wide cut, and that kind of helps keep things a little bit more consistent. There we are. Now we're on to my last cut here, which is going to be this little section right there. And that section is going to go all the way back, basically. So this angle that I'm cutting here is the forward angle of the saddle. And it's not necessarily a prescription here as far as like what angle you should cut to. I'd say that you should probably go for about 45 degrees, maybe a little steeper, because you want that to break away very nicely um, from the, uh, you know, from uh, from the string. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, kind of color the top of this so that you can see it on camera. Let me see if I can focus that a little bit better. Yeah, there we go. So see that little inconsistency there? I'm going to go ahead and work that out. I don't want to go too far back there, but uh, my original line was actually kind of to the point where that little point is. Just want to make that better. Yeah, there we go. So yeah. There's our uh, front of the crown point. And now we need to carve the rear of the saddle. So, rear of the saddle. This part actually matters a little bit um, in terms of how you shape it. You can just have a crown that kind of looks like that, and your string goes over it. And yeah, that's okay. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that. You can do that. This is a little harsh on your strings. Um, and doesn't really provide much of a contact point, in my opinion. What I like to do is I like to have a crown point here that breaks away neatly from the string, and I like to have a rear of the saddle that's actually kind of a curve. And the reason that I like doing a curve is because no matter what angle the string breaks away at the back of this thing to wherever it's going, in this case to the hole, in the uh, tie block, it's going to have a lot of support, or it's going to have as much support as it could, basically, going over this. So if it's coming down here, it's going to round that, go over that round surface and have a lot of support. And even if it's just kind of coming over the top there, it'll have a, a nice solid surface to be on. But you do want to make sure that that curve also neatly breaks away from that contact point. Because if you don't have this, and say you have something more akin to this, and that string breaks over, well now you've got this little gap here. And if you've got that little gap there, that can create some kind of dead notes and sitar buzz and all sorts of weird problems that are hard to diagnose until you look at it real carefully and realize that that's what's going on. So, uh, I think that a curved back is ideal for preventing friction, which that honestly also has a, an issue with uh, creating friction since it's a very, very fine point um, against a, a string. Um, I think that the curve uh, provides a better surface to ride on for the string because it reduces friction and I think it also increases the amount of pressure that the string is really able to apply you know into the saddle and kind of a kind of spread that out a little bit over the saddle and push that down maybe a little harder too. Sorry again about the noise Imagine how I feel doing this day in and day out. And again, here at these points where I have a kind of a, a section 
I'm going to want to dig the file in just a little bit. Yeah, and I'm just going to go ahead and uh, cutting like this. And, um, you know, there's some file skills that should be taught here as well. Um, because I'm not do exactly doing this correctly. You really only want to take a file in one direction. Um, that's both to keep kind of the chatter marks down and also to kind of save wear on your files. Um, I don't really care about the chatter marks here in this case because I'm going to be going through those uh, diamond files afterwards and sanding all those out. Uh, and I also only paid a few bucks for these files. And so they're not the files that I treat with a lot of care. I do have files that I do treat with a lot of care that were very expensive and specialized. But yeah, for these little these little guys, they can they can take a beating. And honestly, uh, I've had the same set for, I don't know, how many years now? And they still do the job just fine. They don't need to be particularly sharp for doing this. But yeah, I'm going to go ahead and um, take my... Uh, pencil and kind of draw on that contact point again so that you can see what we look like now as far as the crown on the saddle. And then I'm going to go ahead and finish this out off camera because uh, I don't think that you need to see me polish out this thing. But yeah. You can see that that narrow contact point, a little bit of this this one here is just a little bit wide. That's going to get thinner as I go through with my diamond files and work that down. Ideally, you kind of do want that to be kind of a, a sharpish point, um, just not a sharpish point pointing directly up into the string. You want a sharpish point kind of pointing where the string is going to go. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, I'll go ahead and get to polishing this out and uh, tune up the guitar, show you what it sounds like, and uh, yeah, We'll see how this goes. thought I'd show you the uh, finished result here. Um, it's going to be a nightmare for this camera to focus on because it is both white and shiny. But there we are. So that's all crowned, polished out, and we're going to go ahead and stick it in the guitar. All right, so we have the new saddle in the guitar, and uh, pretty much everything is done. All that's left is to trim the string ends and maybe give this thing a quick wipe with some guitar polish. I am curious to see where we ended up, and I'm sure that everybody else is too. So let's go ahead and tune this guitar up and check it against the tuner. a little sharp. But it's coming to rest and in, in tune.
pretty close. G's a lot closer than it was. Cool. Cool. Let's check that D one more time. Yeah, it's hard to tell with that one. It looks like it's verging sharp. Not much. It's not much. That last one was pretty close. It's really not liking this D for some reason. Pretty close. So, um, yeah, everything sounds pretty good. So, yeah, we'll go ahead and uh, play a little something on this and uh, see how it sounds. All right, let's see what this sounds like. Another one would be, if I can reach it, here. A little harder to do that one on a non-cutaway. You can also do this guy here. out the uh, G's in first position um, relative to each other. That's real nice. Not hearing any beating there.
um, I think the intonation on this came out sounding pretty great. Um, it's definitely a lot better than it was. I remember when I, I picked this up uh, initially to play Blackbird, um, before I'd done the intonated saddle, it sounded pretty awful um, up here. So, uh, this is a great improvement. So, this is something that can be done on basically any acoustic instrument, or any electric instrument for that matter, that uh, where you have the capability of, of changing where the contact point is for a saddle. So, if you have saddles that are capable of being adjusted or cut um, to the point that they can do this, you can do this on that instrument. Um, I like doing this to classical guitars, um, and I like doing it to ukuleles because it happens that the um, intonation issues that both those instruments have kind of stand out to me in, a, in the kind of sore thumb sort of way. Um, steel strings, you could do this with those as well, um, if you so chose. And, uh, yeah, just about anything else. Um, so yeah, this has uh, been Drew Jones of Drew's Guitar Shop demonstrating a compensated classical saddle. Uh, if you have any need of repair work and you happen to be in the Seattle area, you can check the description for my website. If you found this video helpful and want to kick me a few bucks, there's some links to my Ko-fi and my uh, Patreon in the description as well. And you could subscribe on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month, or you could throw me a few bucks from a one-time thing on Ko-fi, or um, if you, uh, and, uh, sorry, and uh, if you found this video helpful, there are a lot like it on my channel, and you can find links to those on my website, as well as a uh, guide to caring for stringed instruments. Um, plan on adding more content there at some point when I get around to it. Anyway, uh, thank you for watching. You have a great day.